I'm Christina May, the online pastor at World Harvest Church in Enid, Oklahoma. You're about to hear a spirit-filled message from our pastor. So grab your Bible, and if you're a coffee lover like me, grab a cup of coffee and get ready for a personal word that God has for you today. Well, anybody ready for the word of God today? I'm ready. Hopefully you're ready. So I want you to grab your Bible, grab your device. Let's get into the word of God today because I believe the Lord wants to speak something very important into our lives today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we prepare now to go into this message today, Lord, I know there are some things that you want to speak so very strongly here through the message. Lord, we are in a critical time in our nation. So Lord, I know that you have got a plan in all of this. Here as we sit here in the sanctuary with our online family, Lord God, here in just two days, Lord God, Father, we are going to be going into election. Lord, there's so much confusion, so many things that we have to sort through through this time. And Lord, you have stirred this message in my heart here, Lord, not just these last few days, but for these last few weeks. So first of all, I just ask that you help me to unpack it. Lord, help me to speak what you want spoken here today. And Father, more importantly, give us the ears to hear what you're saying in this season. Give us the eyes to see what you want us to see today. And Lord, may we put it into practice in our lives. In your name we pray, and everybody say it with me, amen and amen. We've been in a series here over these last several weeks entitled Real Faith. We've talked a lot of different angles of real faith. We're talking about having crazy faith. Anybody got some crazy faith in this church today? Come on, where's my crazy faith people? Amen. <laughs> talked about baby faith. We've talked about staying faith. Today I wanna talk about having faith for our nation. And you'll understand more here in these next several moments as we dig into the word of God today. The passage that I wanna read here in the opening is something that may seem just kind of out of place, but I believe it's something that we need to be reminded of and keep at the forefront of our lives this coming week. See, we're getting ready to have probably one of the craziest weeks of all of 2020, I believe, this coming week. And of course, as we look back on the year, it's like, Pastor, we've had a lot of crazy weeks. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of mess this year. How many of you know what I'm talking about, right? But here, you know, we're entering into uh, the election where we will elect the next president of the United States and the Lord here has stirred several things in my heart that I want to just give to you. The Lord stirred in my heart. I'm not going to tell you how to vote today. And I actually, let me take a quick survey. I'm just kind of curious. How many of y'all have already voted? Uh, please raise your hand. How many of y'all have already voted? Okay. Not, I don't even think that's 25%. We had probably close to half of the nine o'clock service people that had voted. So about maybe 20, 25% of this service that had voted. So we have that opportunity to go to the polls and so again, I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but more importantly, I want to talk to us about our response to the activities, uh, to what will happen this week. So I want us to go to a very famous passage of scripture just for us to be reminded of, for us to keep in mind as we go into this coming week. It's in Psalms chapter 91. So if you would look with me in Psalms chapter 91 and let these words sink into your heart, maybe in a new way today. Several verses here. Let's read the first seven verses. So Psalms 91 verse one says this. He who dwells in the what? Secret place. Somebody say the secret place. He who dwells in the secret place. Come on, everybody say the secret place. He who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. I will say of the Lord that he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, everybody say it with me, in him I will trust. Come on, where's your trust at today? Is it in the Lord God? Verse three, surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. That verse in the New Living Translation says, for he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from every deadly disease. If we go back to King James, the verse four says, and he shall cover you with his feathers. And under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. New Living Translation says, his faithful promises are your armor and your protection. Verse five, back to New King James. 
You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, verse six, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. New Living Translation says, Don't, do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. I love that. Verse seven, a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand. Come on, everybody say this loudly and proudly with me. But it is shall not come near you. Come on, say it won't come near me. Come on, say it louder. It's not gonna come near me. Amen. Again, an interesting passage to open up this message today, but I believe it's something that we need to hold true to this week. In other words, we as the body of Christ, no matter what happens this week, we better make sure that we stay in the secret place of the Most High. It's a place of safety. It's a place of refuge. It's a place of protection. It is a place of peace. Here for these next few moments, I want to bring to you what I feel is a very important word in relationship to these next few days. For us as a nation, this is a very, very important time. What will take place this week will really establish our next many years as a nation as whoever we elect into office, the, the principles and the things that are legislated, the judges that are put into place over these next few, few, four years, it's, it's gonna be very important for our future as a nation. See, the freedom that we have today and this week to cast our vote for the leaders of our nation is something that we should not take lightly. I want you to understand that. The opportunity that some of y'all have already taken to vote and for the rest that will vote this coming week, it's something that has been fought for. Men and women have died for this. You know, when you look back into history, we see the, the, the movement early on many years ago where women did not have a voice in our nation, where they were not allowed to vote. And we see the movement there where now women are allowed to vote. Ladies, how many of you are glad you get to have a voice? Come on now. The black vote for many years was not allowed, but there was the things that was fought for, for equality in our nation. Now, you know, the, there's the vote from every ethnic group now. There's an ability that people have. Let me tell you, we, we, we shouldn't not take what we're getting ready to do very lightly. You and I have been given a voice. We need to use that voice. But to be truthful with you, I'm like so many today, I, I kind of feel like just kind of pulling into my closet, like, let me know, knock on the door when all this mess is over and I'll come out. But that's not the right approach either. And so I want to address today what I feel should be our political approach to this next week as a Christian, because so many are wrestling with that right now. How do, we, how do we cast our vote? How do we go through this mess that we're in? Just a couple of thoughts, let me just address here. And I, I wanna give you this message today just the way the Lord downloaded it to me. So are y'all all right with this? It may be a little different than I typically minister, but the first thing that I want us to understand is this, that leadership is vitally important. I've heard it addressed to me all my life that everything rises and falls on leadership. Come on, it's important. Let me give you a scripture in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse two in the Message Bible. Proverbs 29 verse two says this. It says, when good people run things, everyone is glad. But when in the ruler is bad, everyone, help me out, what? Groans. When, it, when good people rule. See, many are struggling right now with, with who is good? Who is good? See, one thing we need to remember as the body of Christ when we approach this election coming up is that, that we're not voting on a pastor. We're voting for a leader of our nation and leaders for our state. I, I, I honestly wish, and I'm kind of bringing you some, some Brad Mendenhoff for just a moment. I, I, I wish that we had both good, a good example to follow after and also good leadership, but uh, I, I think I can speak for all of us in that very first presidential base, I was, in that debate, I was so embarrassed. I'm like, we are the laughing stock of the world right now of these two leaders up here acting like third graders on, on the playground. I, I, I wish that we had somebody that we could be proud of and, and, and that led a, a moral life and, and set a, an example of godliness and was also a good leader, but 
and again, this is my, my interpretation where we're at. I, I, I struggle with it right now. I'm struggling with the choices that we have right now. And I'm not disrespecting anything. I'm just speaking some reality here today. And so it really causes me to ask the question that I believe so many of us have been asking, you know, how, how do we do this thing? How are we supposed to move ahead? Our, our approach needs to be, I believe, which person will better lead us in biblical truths. You know, I, I believe that we're kingdom-minded people. I believe what Paul said, we, we live in this world, but we're not of this world. Come on, this world is not our internal home. How many of y'all know that? Amen. Come on, our eternal home is in heaven. And so our struggle is how do we live in this world, but be not of this world? How do we live in this world? And you know, in this whole struggle that we have, let me read you another scripture in Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34 in the New Living Translation says this, that godliness makes a nation great, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Your other translations of the Bible say righteousness exalts a nation. Godliness, godliness is righteousness. See, we see in the Bible days, especially in the Old Testament, that when a nation followed after the Lord, when righteousness was a focus, it prospered. But when they didn't follow after the Lord, judgment would quickly come in. We see through the history of the, the Jewish people that whenever they had a leader that followed after God, God's hand was upon them. But when that leader would stray away from the godly principles that God then would take his hand off of and then judgment would come. I am concerned here as a citizen of the United States of America because we can go back several years back into, uh, you know, a, a few uh, decades back there where, where God was the center of our nation. There was a sense of godliness in our nation. We weren't perfect, but there was still the sense of God was a sinner, the center of all that took place. But something took place back in the 70s and 80s. God began to be pushed out, be put upon a shelf. Now humanism began to prevail, where public opinion now and what man thought now had greater importance than what God thought. I'm concerned. I do believe that we as a nation, we are living in a post-Christian era. It used to be popular to be a Christian. It used to be a popular to talk about God, but that is quickly waning in our nation. Now, Lord God, help us. Let that return once again. Everything rises and falls upon leadership. And let me tell you, I believe that part of the problem that we're having today in our nation is because we haven't had godly men and godly women step up to lead in the area of politics. Listen, we need godly leaders in our nation. We need godly leaders in our state. We need godly leaders in our city. Come on, we are all, I believe, called to lead. And some of us carry, some of y'all carry, I think, an extra grace to lead. But I believe that we should be people that if we're called to lead, we need to lead. And let me tell you, oh, let me rephrase that. I think every Christian is called to lead, some at higher levels than others. But I believe every one of you should lead somewhere. Listen, start at your PTO, your parent-teacher organizations with your schools. Be a leader, amen? Be a leader, and so we see that even in the Bible times, that when the nation followed after the Lord, it prospered, but when they didn't follow after the Lord, judgment would come. As a follower of Christ, I believe it is our duty to cast our vote for the candidate that will most likely follow godly principles and align with the godly Christian values that we carry. Amen? Does our Christian faith have anything to do with politics? I believe that it should. I believe that our influence, our kingdom influence, should influence the the political mountain of our society. Some of our previous presidents, if you go way back in the beginning, there's some statements that they made. I want you to just, to hear some of these statements. John Adams said this. He said, the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. Teddy Roosevelt said this. He said, the teachings of the Bible are so interwoven and entwined with our whole civic and social life that it would be literally impossible for us to figure to ourselves what that life would be if these teachings were removed from Teddy Roosevelt. Woodrow Wilson said this. He says, America was born a Christian nation. America was born to exemplify that devotion to the elements of righteousness which are derived from the revelations of Holy Scripture. I like that. I believe that the United States of America was founded upon religious freedom. God, I believe he ordained it. He put his finger upon the United States of America. There's only one other nation that we see in the history of the world that was founded upon godly principles, and that's Israel. 
we see, I believe that the United States of America was founded upon God, and I believe in God. We still trust in Jesus' name. Come on now. And we know that we have fallen a long ways from that, but where is people that's gonna rise up and lead us back to that righteousness? Harry Truman said this, this is a Christian nation. Thomas Jefferson said, no nation has ever existed or been governed without religion, nor can it be. The Christian religion is the best religion that has been given to man, and I, as chief magistrate of this nation, am bound to give it the, the sanction of my example. Mm. Having leadership that follows God, godly values is vitally important in our life. Amen? Let, let, let me just, again, let me just begin to speak to something else. Whatever happens this week, I believe we must have the right response. Every one of us, we want to see America turn back to righteousness, right? We got to have the right response with whatever happens. A principle that I teach so many times is this. Life is not about what happens to us, but life is about what happens where Come on, let me, are you with me? Life is not about what happens to us, but life is about what happens where? Inside of us. I, I could stand up and preach. We could have a shout and a dance up here, talk about righteousness exalting a nation and the, and the need for godly people. We could have a great service with that, but the thing I need us to understand is no matter what happens this week, we've got to have the right response. See, we are all called to be salt and light in this dark and dreary world that we're living in. See, we can either let our light shine brightly this week or we can add to the chaos. Now, I don't know what's gonna happen. I've heard a lot of prophecies by people that I respect that's prophesying in one direction. This is all I gotta say about this? We'll know in a couple days. Or let me rephrase that. I hope that we'll know in a couple of days. My gut feeling, and I, think this, I don't think this is necessarily the Holy Spirit, I think this is more Brad Mendenhall. I honestly do not think we'll know who our next president is come midnight Tuesday night. Most likely, it's gonna drag out a little bit of time. If we know, great. If we don't, you know what? I'm not gonna worry about it. All I know is come Tuesday night, probably about 9.30, 10 o'clock, I'm going to bed. <laughs> Y'all can stay up and watch the craziness if you want. You know, we're in football season right now. I just reminded of something. I know, football season. Thank God for football. <laughs> We've got a guy in our church that is, he is a fanatic. He's a fanatical fan for one particular college football team. Known him for a lot of few years, and many of y'all know this guy. Probably the more I talk about, you'll know who I'm talking about. But this guy, I mean, he is adamant. He's very outspoken about his team. And he, he's always badgering people that like the other teams, especially when it comes to Bedlam here in Oklahoma. I mean, he, you talk about a trash talker, he trash talks very well with that. I remember here a couple years ago that this gentleman, I mean, he, he was trash talking, you know, he was like, our team's the best. And uh, his team lost that day. And I'm like, I came into church because I knew he was gonna be at church because he's always at church. And I was like, you know what? I bet you, and I, this is what I thought. This guy's gonna be so depressed. He's gonna be so down because his team lost. And I remember coming up to him and kind of ready to console him. I'm like, dude, man, I'm sorry. He said, it's just a ball game. I'm like, wow, you were so biased just a few hours ago. You were so, you were so outspoken just a few hours ago, and now you're like, it's just a ball game. I'm like, you know, now I'm not belittling the election by no means and bringing it down to the level of the ball game. But you know, I think it's okay to talk about what you want to see happen, but you know what? No matter what happens, it's just, it's just an election. I think one benefit that I have of being the age that I'm at now, I've been through a lot of elections that have gone the ways I wanted it to, I've been through a lot of elections that went the way that I didn't want it to go to. And guess what? I'm still alive and breathing today. I think I'm still doing okay today. Amen? I still think I look okay today. No response. That's kind of what I thought. Not even on the front left row right over here. If our hope is in a politician, we're looking way too shallow in life. As a Christian, we have 
to dedicate. We have a very delicate balance, though, to maintain. See, on one hand, we know that our hope is not in the things of this world. But on the other hand, we know that we're also supposed to be making an impact on the world around us. We're supposed to be taking a real Jesus to a real world. So I do believe that we have, that, that we as the people of God be as Christians, that we are called to serve. And I believe there's an extra measure of grace that is placed upon some to lead at, at the national level, at the state level, at, at the city level. I believe there are those people. So it's a delicate balance in this. And, and I'm sure I can speak for all of us. It's very easy to sit back and be what we call like an armchair quarterback. I mean, some of y'all were doing that yesterday through the games. Well, if I was the coach, I would have called this. I would have done that. It's very easy, but you're not in the situation. You don't have the data that those coaches have to make that call. And just as ludicrous as it is for us to sit back and criticize a, a somebody on television or watching a game that you have no history with, I believe it's the same way for us to sit back and judge politicians. I, I have learned this personally in, in the events that's taken place this year with close people around me. We of y'all know Jonathan Waddell. I mean, he's one of our executive pastors here on the executive pastoral team, but yet he also serves as a city commissioner. And I've seen some of the mess that he has had to walk through to navigate us. Listen, if there was ever a time that you, I don't think you'd want to be a politician, it's 2020 <laughs> to be in leadership. But God called him and he pointed him at a place and time is this. Let me tell you, this is what I've learned through this whole process. He's had to make some decisions pertaining to 55,000 people in our city as a leader of our city. In a place of authority, he's had to make some decisions and the only thing he has to base himself off of, of course, is his consciousness and what the Holy Spirit is telling him, but he has the professionals telling him the decisions that need to be made and I've seen so many people sit back and criticize this judgment. Let me tell you, I'm not sure if you wouldn't make the same decision if you was responsible for 55,000 people and you had all the experts telling you the same thing. We've got to get away from this point where we're always criticizing authorities over us. You and I's position is not to criticize, but I'll get to it here in just a moment. My last and final point I'm gonna give us here today is we gotta to pray. Our responsibility is to pray for those that are authority over us, not to criticize. The burden of leadership has been crazy heavy this year for anybody that's in leadership, especially those that are leading cities. Could you imagine leading a state that our governor has to lead? Could you imagine leading this nation Every one of us would probably, well, if I was a leader, I would do this. Would you really? It's a whole new burden. It carries. Everything rises and falls upon leadership. Psalms 118, let me read this scripture to you here. Psalms 118 says this, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord, verse nine says, than to put your confidence in princes. We could say it this way, in presidents, in senators, in governors, and commissioners. It's better to put our trust where? In God. Come on, where's your trust at today? So let me leave you with this. Three, three responses, three things that we've got to do. Number one is this, and some of y'all have already done. We've got to vote. Use your voice. You have a right to do it, use it. Listen, I read this this week. Listen to this. Who you vote for is between you and God. And I leave that to your consciousness and guidance from God as you hear from him. Believe me, though, there are no perfect candidates I hear many people say they refuse to choose between the lesser of two evils. But until Jesus runs for office, it will always be a choice between the lesser of two evils. George Washington wasn't perfect. Abraham Lincoln wasn't perfect. There has never been a perfect candidate, president, senator, or Supreme Court justice because they are all flawed human beings just like you and me. We are all imperfect people. That really helps me. Dr. Mark Rutland said this, we are imperfect people in an imperfect election and an imperfect nation voting for imperfect people in the hope that they will rise to the moment of leadership and somehow surprise us. So in other words, he says, here it is. Every Christian citizen should vote. In fact, they have a sacred duty to vote. So vote. If you haven't, vote on Tuesday. Do your part, cast your vote, and then respond with grace. Trust God. Trust God. Number two is this. Number one, we got to vote. Number two, we got to honor. Everybody say honor. Honor. First Peter chapter two. Look at this passage of scripture with me here. 
First Peter chapter two, verse 13 says this. It says, for the Lord's sake, respect all human authority, whether the king as head of state, verse 14, or the officials that he has appointed, for the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and honor those who do right. Verse 15, it is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people. How many got some ignorant people around you today? Don't look at your neighbor right now. They may think you're thinking about them. Those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. Verse 16, for you are free, yet you are God's slaves, so don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Verse 17, look at it. Respect everyone. Love your Christian brothers and sisters. Fear God. What's the last three words? Respect the king. Other translations say honor the king. Now, Peter is writing this in this moment. Now, let me put this passage of scripture into context. Because unless you know the context of this scripture, you really don't get the value for what Peter's saying. Peter, at the time that he's writing this, they're still living under Roman influence. Does anybody know who the emperor was at the time that Peter wrote this? It was Emperor Nero. What was the significance about Nero? Nero is known as the worst emperor to the Christians during that time frame. Nero at that time was killing Christians. At this time, Nero was putting Christians in lion's dens. He was putting them in the Colosseums where lions were tearing the Christians apart. It was during this time that Nero was crucifying Christians. He was hanging them on crosses through the city. He was burning them at the stake. Where you went, people were crying and wailing. There was to be times they put the Christians on the cross and it would take hours or even days for them to die. And here's Peter saying, honor the king, respect the king. In other words, Peter knew that other response as Christians that no matter who is in leadership, we should show honor to. That's a tough statement. Let me just say this. Here at World Harvest Church, we will always be pro-president. In other words, we will always respect and we will always honor the president no matter who it is, no matter what party's in place, okay? Our response is to honor. Everybody say honor. So this is what I wanna just share with you. Every one of you that are, that are pro-Trumpers in this place today, how are you gonna react if Biden is our next president? <laughs> we know how the baby's gonna act. <laughs> I, I couldn't recover from that one. So <laughs> All of you that are tired of Trump, what are you gonna do if he gets elected to another four years? What I'm saying is this, where's your hope? Where's your joy at? Where's your confidence at? And what are you gonna do about it? Amen? Amen. We're gonna do what? We're gonna honor, right? Okay, I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna give you the answer. The answer is honor. What are you gonna do this week, no matter who's elected? What are we gonna do? Honor. honor. Very good. We're gonna honor. And then thirdly of all, we're going to do one of the most important things that we as the body of Christ that only we can do. Thank you, it's to pray. Our response after you have voted, more importantly, to honor, third of all, then we've got to pray. Does prayer make a difference? Oh, yes, it does. Look with me in 1 Timothy chapter 1 right quick. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. This is the Passion Translation. It says this. Most of all, I'm writing to encourage you to pray with What? Come on, pray with gratitude to God. Not just flippantly, but with gratitude to God. It says, pray for all men with all forms of prayers and requests as you intercede with what? How are we supposed to intercede? Come on, how are we supposed to intercede? With intense passion. Come on, that means with a heart in it. Whoever is elected, come on, with a heart in it. It goes on and says in the next verse, it says this, and pray for every political leader and representative so that we would be able to live tranquil, undisturbed lives as we worship the awe-inspiring God with pure hearts. Church, 
our response this week has got to be to pray. If Trump gets another four years, we better pray. If Biden is elected, we better pray. Amen. I said all of that I said to say, we've got to be people that are living at a higher level where we trust God. Do you believe God's in control? I believe. There's so many different tangents that I could go off this message, but this is what I believe the Lord wanted me to share with us today. Now, this is how I believe the Lord wants us to close, though. Just the way I end my third point there, to pray. I want us here for just a couple moments. I'm not, we're not going long today, so don't get nervous. But don't leave early either. Because I believe the Lord is asking us to pray. So I want you to pray with me here today. Would you do that? So this is what I want you to do. Just take your stuff that you've got in your lap, your phones, your devices, your Bibles, your purses. Just put them off to the side. And we're going to spend just a few moments doing what the Scripture commands us. We're going to sp- respond well and we're going to pray. Okay? I'm going to ask... Jonathan Waddell, I talked about him a few moments ago. He serves on our executive pastoral team, but he's also a city commissioner, as I mentioned a moment ago. So he's coming really with two hats on today as a city official, but also as a spiritual leader. And I believe there's something to be released today. So he's gonna pray, I'm gonna pray, but I want us, church, I want us to do what scripture says, to pray. Will you join me in prayer? Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Jonathan, go ahead. Father God, I thank you for for this time. And as odd as it is to say that, because we look around us and we see the wind and we see the turmoil and we see, you know, in some places outright chaos, we still thank you. We thank you because we know in the midst, we know that you are with us. And we know that regardless of the outcome of whatever election and whatever, uh, whatever body that is being represented, Father God, we know no matter what, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and that you reign up over, over them all. And that when it is all said and done, that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. With that in mind, we pray, Father, peace. We pray wisdom that as every person goes to cast their ballot, that the Holy Spirit stirs within them in order for them to do what it is that you would have them to do and that they walk away with a peace that there will be no chaos within their minds, any, any wavering, that they will be sure that they have done what it is that you had called them to do. And that once that is done, that they go back into the world with the love of the Lord and that they love their neighbor. That they pray for their leader. And that we are the light that the world will look to, that despite the world, that America will be contentious, that the church will be the ones to be able to say, hey, look, we love you. I don't care what political side you fall upon, that we are all children of God and we love you. That we as children of God keep perspective. We love you, Father. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Father, we come to you seeking you here today, Lord God. Father, we do, just as Jonathan was praying there, I just reminded, Lord God, of the grace that you place upon so many to lead. Father, we do pray that just as you said in the scriptures, Lord, that you raise one up and you put another down, Lord God. So Father, would you raise up godly people, righteous leaders here in our nation, Lord God, from the White House to the State House, Lord, to our city government, Lord God, to our schools, Lord God. Lord, you're calling people to stand up and to be a voice. 
So Lord, we pray over this coming week, Lord Jesus. Father, we declare, Lord God, Father, that no matter what happens, Lord Jesus, Father, that we're not gonna be moved, we're not gonna be dismayed, we're not gonna worry, we're not gonna struggle with it, but Lord, because our hope is in you. And Lord God, we pray for a move of your spirit here in our nation, Lord God. Father, a move of righteousness, Lord God. Father, let all the events that take place, Lord, let it turn people's eyes and their focus towards you, Lord God. Father, because I believe that you're wanting to pour out your spirit here in these last days that we're living in, Lord God. Father, a revival to sweep across our land, Lord God. A revival that will bring forth your love. A revival that will bring forth your unity, Lord God. So, Father, we thank you, Lord God. Would you move in our nation, Lord God? Father, would you move in our state? Would you move in our city, Lord Jesus? Father, we just ask for a move of your spirit in a mighty, mighty way, Lord God. And Father, we come against the spirit of chaos, that spirit of division, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we declare over that spirit that it cannot rule and reign in our nation. But Lord, let your love prevail. You said when the enemy would come in, you said like a flood that you raise up a standard against him, Lord God. So Father, may your standard of your word, Lord, the, the kingdom principles, Lord God, may it be a banner waving high in our nation, Lord God, a banner of righteousness, Lord God. Father, give us leaders after your heart, Lord Jesus. And Father, whoever is our next president, Lord God, Father, we pray that they have an encounter with you in a magnificent and in a beautiful way, Lord God. Father, that no matter which one is in office here over these next few years, Lord God, Father God, we pray that your Holy Spirit invades, Lord God, our White House. In Jesus' name, Lord God, we pray for the hearts of our leaders today. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks again for listening. We hope that this message inspires, challenges, and fuels you up to take a real Jesus to a real world. If you'd like to connect with us in any way, please go to harvestenid.com slash connect. Or if you'd like to learn more about us as a church, please go and check us out at harvestenid.com. We can't wait to share another message with you next week.